is much higher than income poverty. And we define asset poverty as the ability of a household to exist at the poverty level for three months if their main source of income is disrupted. And this is a measure, I don't know how many of you saw, probably six months ago, the ABC News covered this tent city that sprang up overnight in Sacramento. And they were interviewing people in the tent city, and one guy was a construction worker who'd been making $17 an hour. And he said, after three months, after he lost his job, I was in a tent. And it's all about not having that safety net, not having that cushion to help absorb the challenges that life uh, throws you. In the United States today, 22.5% of Americans live in asset poverty. And over 14 of, the, of them live in extreme asset poverty, which means they have zero or negative net worth. Two months ago, the Pew Research Center do, uh, released data that many of you may have seen on the racial wealth gap. And they described the fact that the gap, based on race, had reached its higher, highest point within 25 years. As of today, a white household has 20 times the wealth of an African American household and 18 times the wealth of a Hispanic household. We also found that 24% of African American and Hispanic households have no assets other than a car. And this is compared to 6% of white households. So our whole focus on thinking about, there's seats up front, so come on up, how we change that is absolutely critical in policy. And I will then say that it's no accident that we have the level of disparities that we do, because in many ways, it is a creature of our very policies. And last year, CFPD released a study called Upside Down, the $400 billion federal asset budget. Every year we spend <laughs> $400 billion on building wealth of Americans. And out of that, greater than 50% of those benefits went to the wealthiest 5% of taxpayers. We found that the top 1% received an average of $25,000 in subsidies, and the poorest less than $5. One of my favorite phrases is that when we provide incentives to middle and upper class people, we call that policy. When we provide incentives to low-income people, we call that subsidy. It's all the same thing, and we're not doing it in the most efficient way, which is really why we're here today. The great news about this is over the past two decades, and many of the people on our panel are the leaders in this, we have figured out how to do this better. Whether it's innovation at the local level, at the state level, or changing policy at the federal level. And so what we want to do today is really explore what are those solutions that work and what are the policies that need to support those solutions so we can go at scale. You had a host of policies identified in the policy agenda through the Opportunity Nation, which spanned the savers credit, bonuses at tax time, R&D for small businesses, access to capital for small businesses, the auto IRA, whose architect we have right here, David, and other very innovative policies. <coughs> so with that, I just want to give you the big context on what we're talking about, and then introduce our extraordinary panel. And I'm gonna go down the row. We have Emily Allen, who's the Vice President for Income at the AARP Foundation and is really focused on how do we fight poverty and build opportunity for older Americans, uh, many of whom are us right now. Next to her is my dear friend and colleague, Jose Cisneros, who's the treasurer of the city and county of San Francisco, who has been one of the leaders in the United States on initiating some of the most effective asset building innovations in America. I'll just give two, but he'll give us more. 
He started the whole movement to get the un- and underbank banked with Bank on San Francisco and is now the architect of the first universal publicly available children's savings accounts program for every public school kindergartner in San Francisco called Kindergarten to College. And if you've ever seen a kindergarten kid talk about bank account, your heart is just gonna be taken. Um, next to him is my new friend as of today, Hill Harper, an author, actor, and activist and what was so exciting about reading his bio is she's really been an advocate for economic justice his whole life. He has a new book out, which is called The Wealth Cure, Putting Money in Its Place. And I'm very, very proud to say we're all alumni of the same alma mater, so that really scares <laughs> us. Next to him is David John from the Heritage Foundation, and he's been a long-term partner um, in CFED, but in this field. And he is probably the leading scholar in America thinking about retirement savings and how we create that kind of financial security in the long term. And then next to him is Vidar Jorgensen, a board member with Grameen America. And I have to say, Vidar, after reading your resume, a serial entrepreneur in every way, shape, and form, who will really help bring us the small business perspective. So my goal today, because we have a shortened time, is to get the panel to really share some very provocative ideas and thoughts, and then to open it up for a broader conversation. So the first question I'd like to ask each one, starting with Emily, is from where you sit and from what your experience is, looking ahead five years, what are the three things you would recommend we do to create real opportunity to build economic independence? Emily. Thank you. This is on, can everyone hear me? Great, terrific. Um, well, thanks so much, and, and Andrew, that was a great way to, to tee it up. Um, obviously, in this amazing panel, um, you know, my goal is to really focus people's attention on those who are 50 and older. I very often uh, start conversations like this by having people close their eyes and think about someone in their lives that's struggling right now. And the more I've done that recently, it's been very interesting. I, I get stories then about a person's parents who are struggling, a person's grandparents who are struggling, an older brother who is struggling, uh, has lost a job, has lost a home. Um, and, and very often when I come and talk and they see AERP, um, your mind sometimes goes to that elderly person, oh, that senior person who's on Social Security. But I'm, I'm here to get you to focus a bit on the fact that I'm talking about people who are 50 and older, and as I'm looking around the room, there's a number of us in the room um, who are 50 and older, and um, realizing the struggle that right now, there are almost 20 million, that's 20 million, Older adults are not able, do not have adequate financial resources and are struggling to meet one or more of their basic needs. There's nine million seniors facing the threat of hunger every day. There's 13 million house, older adult households that can't afford their homes or do not have adequate homes. Um, and many are suffering from the loss of a network because they've lost jobs. So our goal at the foundation is really to get people to focus on the fact that, you know, in addition to the conversations about what we need to do with youth and, and young families, we need to make sure that the older adult is represented in these discussions. So that's, that, if I look three years down the road, I wanna make sure that, that people are, are beginning to shine a light on those issues. I was having conversations um, not too long ago with, with a, a outside organization and they were talking about kind of the lost generation, that 16 to 24 year old that has really been struggling and, and that you know they weren't sure about focusing on the older adult. And they said, well, let's think a little bit about who those folks' parents are. And very often the reasons, the root cause of some of the struggle of those 16 to 24 year olds is the fact that mom and dad have lost jobs or they've had to uproot and, and move to communities or they can't uproot and move somewhere else because their homes, uh, they can't sell their homes. So in the foundation, as we look at kind of the three things, um, you know, certainly, we need to make sure that we're investing in individuals um, and, and not relying on old strategies for new problems. We have an unemployment problem right now, there's no doubt about that, 
but it's a very, very different landscape. And so coming from a nonprofit world where we operate community level programs and things like that, we've operated employment and training programs for 40 years. But it, it would, it's incumbent upon us and groups like us to really look at how we apply new strategies to these problems. Um, it's, it's not a simple case of, of job training and skill development. Yes, that's a critical piece of it, but more and more we've got to get the business community involved. And as I look at, at it from the perspective of, of helping older adults um, get back into the workforce and get good jobs, I've got to engage the business community and have them see the, the ROI in investing in someone who is older. The return on investment that they get in the way of loyalty and quantifying that loyalty and making sure that they understand that um, an experienced individual um, is a valuable member of their team along with the multi-generational team that they're forming. We've got to invest in communities. That's the, the, the second one. Um, we, in fact, this is the first year that the foundation is actually um, switching more into a grant making organization. There are literally thousands of organizations out across the country, small, small, medium, and large nonprofits that are trying to do excellent work, but their budgets have been cut, their capacity has been cut, and so we have got to reinvest in the, in the infrastructure, and I'm using that in a little bit of a different term than is normally used, but the infrastructure, the, the fabulous work that's going on at community colleges and nonprofits and things like that across the country, we've got to invest in that because that's at the front lines of, of what people need and where people go for help. Um, and what's happening now is we end up trying to refer individuals to that, that very good infrastructure and they're overrun, they're overrun. Um, you know, we've talked with, with folks that have a, a waiting list of 20,000 people that need help. Um, and what can we do? So we've got to reinvest in, in communities and reinvest in, um, in that infrastructure. And then we've got to really invest in that systemic change. Um, and I, I'm sure uh, Mr. Cisneros will talk about you know, the, the innovative financial products and services that really need to change the marketplace. Um, related to providing the types of products, um, be they debit cards or um, you know bank accounts and things like that, that need that are that are really relevant for the older adult um, and for the low income. We've got to we've got to show them that it's a relevant product for them and give them a safe way to save and and, and um, keep their money. Um, and then a, a little bit on a different track, um, kind of as we think about trying to re-employ people. Critically important that as we think about asset building, um, to me that, you know, that's, that's a pathway towards um, stability. Um, I'm, I'm very focused right now as we get people re-employed in that, in that shorter term emergency savings. Mm -hmm. If we can get people to think about the fact that if I just have a, if I get re-employed and let's say my transmission goes out that weekend and I can't make it to the job on Monday, I'm gonna lose that job. And we find that particularly with people that have been out of work, and, and I think you heard Joanne, our, our president, say earlier, you know, on average, an older adult is out of work um, for 54 weeks. If they finally get that job again, we've got to put in place the incentives and the, the uh, process that enables them to have even a small amount of emergency savings so that they can fix that transmission, they can put gas in the car, so they don't end up calling in and, and losing that job eventually and, and kind of losing that road to stability. Great, thank you, Emily. My one favorite fact, vis to be what Emily said, is 50% of all the human beings since the beginning of time who've ever reached the age 75 are alive today. It gives you a sense of how dramatic the demographics of aging have, has changed. Jose, I'm sorry, you were just taking your drink of water. Uh, I, won't, I won't drink a thing. It's, it's <laughs> here. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Thank you, Andrea, for, for uh, steering us through this conversation. I want to talk for a minute about what's going on at local government level. And I think a lot of the work that we've, we've been talking about here, a lot of the, the, the programs and the initiatives about helping people get better educated about how to be successful with their money, is work we've tri typically seen out of nonprofits. But in the last few years, we've seen local government and other levels of government, but I think most interestingly, local government really step up. And let me tell you about a few programs we've launched in San Francisco that have really um, uh, proven very successful. 
The first one is the one Andrea mentioned, which is our, our effort to reach out to folks who were unbanked. Why did we do that? We had an estimate of 50,000 households in San Francisco. So what do you think? One to two adults per household? 70 to 80,000 adults in San Francisco with no bank account at all. Guess what? Largely low income households. That's about 10% of our entire population. And you might say, well, is that such a big deal? Well, I'll tell you why it is a big deal. If you don't have a bank account, when you get paid, you have nowhere to go with your paycheck but one of these check cashers. And these places literally rip people off. Someone who takes every one of their paychecks over the course of a year to a check cashier pays between $800 and $1,000 a year in fees to do what the rest of us do pretty much for free, <coughs> particularly if we have any kind of direct deposit or, or low cost account. Why would a low income family be paying that kind of exorbitant predatory rates just to do something else that the rest of us are managing to do for a whole lot less? We wanted to see what we could do about that. We used the city's voice and the city's convening power to bring together all the banks. I think we were the early Occupy movement, actually, is what we were. We brought together all the banks in San Francisco and we said, we're going to ask low-income folks to become your customers because we think that'll be better for them than going to these predatory check cashers. But we want you to offer them low-cost, appropriate starter accounts for somebody who's never had a bank account before. And for some banks, that meant they had to change their products, and we got them to do it. We ended up with three-quarters of all the banks and credit unions in San Francisco joining our program, so we really could go out with a, a universal message that said, Go get a bank account, you'll be better off. We guarantee you it'll be lower cost. And each year that we've run that program now for the over five years that we've had it in San Francisco, the banks and credit unions have reported opening over 10,000 accounts for new accounts for unbanked folks in San Francisco. This program has proven successful. This program was not expensive to do. This program takes some work and it takes effort and it takes the voice of the mayor of the city maybe the treasurer of the city, um, other city leaders, but it's using that voice in a unique and new and different way that helped us be successful with the program. So successful that now there are 100 cities across the country that are either have already launched their own bank on their city program are in the process of doing so. So it's really taken off and we're excited about that, but we didn't want to stop there. Having a bank account is important, but you need to know how to handle it, how to use it, how to manage your money. We've done a number of programs to improve our financial education, including just convening all the people in the city, all the groups that are already doing this type of work, consumer credit counseling, other community groups, um, or uh, credit repair organizations. We now convene them every three months, help them get better at doing what they're doing, and we've launched a website that allows the public to find those resources in a way they never could do before. So we've done that around what we call our smart money network. We've actually tried to make a difference in this terrible world of predatory payday lending loans. I'm sure many of you are familiar with these. Come borrow your next paycheck, a short two-week loan, only 300, 400% APR, and that's the day you take out that loan. And most of them roll it over. So that loan goes to 800, 900% and no percentage rate of interest. We've worked with uh, a number of credit unions in San Francisco to do an essentially identical loan, same criteria, same opportunity, interest rate never goes above 18%. We're trying to make, see if that we can make that a go so people have a better, safer option than getting these predatory loans. We've also put a moratorium in place in San Francisco. We can't shut down check cashers and payday lenders. Gosh, we wish we could. But we at least put a moratorium in place that said there are no new ones. We're capping off at this incredible saturation point. We have more check cashers and payday lenders in San Francisco than we have McDonald's outlets and Starbucks locations combined. Oh, wow. And guess what? They're only in the low-income neighborhoods. You're not finding them in the wealthy neighborhoods. So think of how saturated they are in those um, African-American, Latino neighborhoods. That is what our, our, our community is facing. I want to talk briefly about two exciting programs that really, I think, Andrea, talk to me, talk for me, represent where I think we're going in the next few years. One of them is the program Andrea mentioned. There is an exciting study that shows that if a child grows up with a savings account in the child's name for college, that child is seven times more likely to go to college. We could not ignore that kind of research. We wanted to make 
every child in San Francisco is seven times more likely to be successful. So we in the city have now, and this is an expensive program, we have invested our own city money and our own city labor into administering and creating for each and every child who enters the San Francisco Public Schools at kindergarten, kindergarten, automatically a college savings account for every child. No parent signature required, no initiative required, nothing. The child goes to school, a few weeks later, an envelope shows up, welcome to your kindergarten to college, college savings account, here's your account number, here's how you make deposits, here's the first $50 that's already put, put in, in your name. And that, we are confident, is going to make a difference in our landscape. It's already helped because we are already working with the school system who's agreed to put financial education curriculum right into the classroom. Right into the classroom. Now the teachers know that every one of their students has this account. They're comfortable going out and talking about what do we do with our money and what, how do we manage our account and how are we going to save for college. The last program I want to talk about is another new one that we're about to launch. And this is around the issue of electronic pay. I'm sure many of us in this room are using some form of electronic pay. Direct deposit is pretty much what everyone uses. 80% of all workers in the country get paid electronically by direct deposit. A lot of good reasons to do that. It's safer, it's faster, it's easier, it's better for our, our relationship. There's studies that show that direct deposit is one of the key drivers for people being more, more successfully and more educated with their money because simply by getting paid through direct deposit. Guess who's not getting paid largely by direct deposit? Low-wage workers. When you look at low-wage workers, two-thirds or more are not using direct deposit. And many of those don't use it because their employer doesn't even offer it to them. We want to change that in San Francisco, so we're creating a new program. We're calling Current CSF. We're going to reach out to every employer in San Francisco, large, medium-sized, and small, and say, we want to work with you. We want to help you, employers to be more capable, give more, better offerings to your employees. Certainly make sure you all offer direct deposit, but you can go, let's go beyond that. Let's help you educate your workers right there in their workplace. Help them understand how they can handle their money better and how they can be better off if they sign up for a direct deposit or some form of electronic pay. Let's make San Francisco the first paper paycheck free city in the United States. How exciting would that be? And once we get there, no more paychecks to take to check cashers anymore. I will be very excited about that. That's the vision I want to see a few years down the road. Children with every single one of them help, having college savings accounts. Parents with not only bank accounts, but direct deposits, safe pay, and a better financial household for themselves and their family. Thank you, Jose. Jose has a great word of wisdom that I've been sharing across the country, which is the worst thing you can do for an un or underbanked person is to give them a check. Better you give them cash than give them a check. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Hill Harper. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. The, uh, one of the running themes that I talk about in my book, The Wealth Cure, is this idea that you can't be free if the cost of being you is too high. And if we think about our low-income folk, the cost of being them is, 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 is inordinately high compared to folks who are higher earners. And Jose kind of spoke to this. So if we're talking about three things, in my mind, obviously, uh, since I wrote a book about financial literacy, financial literacy is at the top of that list. Um, you know, certainly investment in education and, and certainly early childhood education, et cetera, and then stopping predatory practices. Uh, those, those three elements alone, and, we, we, and if we go back to what I said, it, it, you can't be free if the cost of being used too high. When we, the, the, my foundation, the Manifest Your Destiny Foundation, we deal with so many individuals where their credit card fees and their payday loan fees and the services that they pay for, just their grocery fees um, are incredible. I'll give you an example. I bought a building in New Orleans. I, I own a hotel in New Orleans. And I, bought a, I bought a building in New Orleans where I wanted to put uh, a healthy uh, grocery store chain in a lower income neighborhood. Uh, so I brought Whole Foods down. I brought uh, Fresh Choice and I brought some other folks down to, to, to really try to sell them on putting one of those in this, in this community. And uh, the institutionally racist notions that can come up and 
and amongst the corporation is that, well, listen, you know, we're providing a, a, a healthier alternative, so, but, but our price point is much higher. And, and, and I had to educate them to, to, to make them realize that the price point that folks are paying in these low-income neighborhoods at the local corner bodegas and the grocery stores are significantly higher than the rich folks are paying in Whole Foods for the same carton of milk. So it's not a, it's not a price point issue. Um, these folks are already paying more than folks pay your Whole Foods, or some people call Whole Paycheck. <laughs> so, Part of it is, 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 is educating folks, selling folks, and creating incentives and, and, and giving them reasons why we can, we, can, we can create new opportunities within certain communities. And, 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 and the other part is just literally taking the time um, to invest and, 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 and really putting your money where your mouth is and your time and your sweat equity into these communities, into the, into the folks. And that's why I love uh, what, what you're doing. Um, and, and he's going to speak to that, but it's just, you know, even on the level of microfinance, um, there are ways to approach uh, whether it's whether it's building a, a, a putting a Whole Foods in a community or or, or micro loans um, to to and anywhere in between that where we can have real <coughs> substantial change. But for me, my fight right now is around the, the space of financial literacy and wiping out um, the, the the costs that are that are that are that are crippling and robbing the freedom of, of many of our lowest income individuals. There, there's a pastor here, um, DeForest Soares, who has a, a spoke at his church a few weeks ago uh, in New Brunswick, and he has this wonderful uh, 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 talk when he, when he talks about credit cards. And he says, you know, uh, when a company sends, if a company sent you a card in the mail and it said slave card on the front, you'd be upset and you'd send a letter. Um, you'd be insulted. But instead they send you a card that says gold or platinum, or, or, or silver or whatever it says, and you're happy to have it. And then they trap you. And so many of our folks um, are, are trapped uh, in debit card fees, credit card debt, and payday loan fees. And uh, it's, it, we have to deal with that. And part of it's financial literacy, and part of it is just literally clamping down. Thank you. You know, the Casey Foundation has a fabulous report, which is the high cost of being poor, which is exactly itemizing what you're talking about across the board. David? Well, let's see, note to self, don't come after Hill Harper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Stuart Butler talked about the value of savings, and it's not just a matter of having assets, it's what it does to your outlook and how you look towards the future and how you start to build something rather than just existing day to day. But the fact is that talking about savings is a lot easier than doing it. Because if you think of it, especially if you're in a low-income community, where's the nearest bank? Who knows? Is this something that's going to welcome you? Where's the nearest credit union? Probably a better choice, but are they going to, where are they, et cetera. Then once you get in there, you have to figure out how you choose an account. What do you do? And people are going to be talking about things that don't necessarily make sense. Now, financial literacy is a key factor in this. And I personally don't understand why anyone can graduate from high school in the United States without at least one course in financial literacy. It doesn't make any sense. But we also know how to fix retirement and make it easier. It's called automatic enrollment. And we use it for retirement savings accounts right now. It used to be that in order to do retirement savings, you had to figure out, can I afford to participate? How much am I going to invest? What am I going to invest it in? Uh, what do I do with this pool of money once I retire? And about a little over 10, 12 years ago, automatic enrollment came in where in automatic enrollment, you're part of the plan unless you say no. You are investing a certain amount, unless you say, I want to do more or less. You've got control of this, complete control over this. But it's done for you, at least as far as a guide. What do I invest in? Well, you're going to invest in this option unless you choose something else. Again, you've got complete control. Now, the problem that we face right now is that in the United States, only about 50% of the workforce has access to a retirement savings account. The other 50% basically could theoretically go into a bank or some other institution and open an IRA. 
an IRA participation is somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 to 10 percent, and I think those are optimistic figures. So people don't, and they don't for obvious reasons. So what we're looking at is two factors here. Number one is, it's been introduced in Congress, it's called the automatic IRA. It was endorsed by the McCain campaign and by the Obama campaign in 2008. It has bipartisan support. We've worked very closely with AARP and CFED in working and developing this. And what it does is to make sure that we move from 50% participation or opportunity here to 90%. It's a very simplified, easy, automatic enrollment retirement savings plan. But that's half of it. Retirement savings is key, but we are also working now we're looking at the British and the Australians. We figure we can learn from them. Uh, and they have a method where they open up this retirement savings platform to other types of savings also. So you're, especially when you're younger, you would be automatically enrolled and part of your money always would go into this retirement savings account because early money grows the longest and the, the fastest. But you'd also have a non-retirement savings account where this would be money, it might go into a bank. If you're saving for a first home, if you're trying to deal with college, if you're trying to get some more training, whatever it is, even you know emergencies and that sort of thing. We can use the same mechanism to expand retirement re savings to general savings. And this will give people the opportunity not only to change their outlook, but actually to have some money as a savings safety net. Thanks. Thank you, David. I'm Vidar Jurgensen, and uh, there are 800 microfinance organizations in the U.S. Only 200 of them actually lend money. The other 600 primarily do financial training because banks can meet their Community Reinvestment Act requirements by either actually lending money in low-income areas or as a proxy doing financial training, and it's less risk to do training than to actually lend money. Of the 200 microfinance organizations that lend money, probably only three or four are really sustainable and at scale. Axion is one of them. There's some Opportunity International. These are great programs. Axion goes to a higher level entrepreneur for me in America focuses on people who are at or below the official poverty level. And here in New York, that means an income of about $20,000 a year for a family of four. And we actually check their income, we go to their house to make sure that they're sort of down to our standards. In order to get a loan, people have to join or form a group of five. We won't do it for them. And this actually acts like a credit check because if someone can't put together a group of five, there's maybe something wrong there. The loans are always to individuals. They don't cross-guarantee their loans. But if a group is not regular in their payments, then it limits the amount that they can increase their loans. Our starting loan is $1,500. It has to be for income-producing activities. Before they get their loan, they have to go through five one-hour training sessions. Each day, they have to bring in $2. If they're late to the training session, if they're late with their $2, we say maybe you're not ready for this program yet, and maybe you should come back later when you're ready for it. In other words, we let them know their rules, and if you don't follow the rules, you have to come back later when you're ready to follow the rules. And we're not a bank, so we, uh, we have uh, the first $10 that's collected the first day is taken home by one member, and then they bring it back the next day and then it's joined by another $10 and another member takes it home and they sort of see other people handling their money and they begin to think, well, do I really want this person in this group or not? So sometimes they actually adjust themselves a little bit. Then at the end of the training session, we either graduate the whole group or in one in 20 cases, we, we ask the whole group to go through the training again. But if they pass, then we open a no-fee savings account uh, for them at a local bank. And by the way, the banks have been great in helping us with these accounts. It's been hard for them to do it, but we use whatever bank has a branch nearby. But Citibank, uh, Capital One have been extremely supportive. 
uh, in helping us do this. And we get them an ATM card for all of these people. It's the very first uh, bank account they've had. Our people don't use payday lenders because they don't qualify for them. They don't have a bank account. They don't have a paycheck. So they don't have regular income. Their only alternative is uh, loan sharks on the street. In Queens, you can get a loan of $100 in the morning for a promise to pay $110 that evening. And that's two or 3,000% interest by the time it's uh, compounded. That's the only alternative they have. We've noticed that the very poor below the poverty level are far more reliable in terms of repayment and in terms of savings. Uh, because they realize that if they blow this, they're back to the loan sharks again. So they're really great. We lend only to women and uh, only for income producing activities. We also enroll them in Experian. Um, and uh, if they pay their loans back, there are weekly payments, either 25 weekly payments or 50. If they pay them back on time and they have no adverse reporting, they'll have a credit score of uh, 660 to 700. And so we've got borrowers who are below the poverty level who have credit scores of 660 uh, to 700. We have a 99% repayment rate. We have branches in Jackson Heights, in Brooklyn, in Bronx, in Upper Manhattan, one in Omaha, Nebraska, one in Indianapolis, and we have the funding for one in San Francisco. And we should have one of these in every part of the country. It was very hard to raise the initial money for New York because uh, microfinance had really not been successful. It's, it's very easy to lend the money out. It's hard to get it in. The secret sauce to our program is that the branch managers are all Grameen bankers from Bangladesh who've done this for 20 years. If I had gone to Bangladesh and studied six months, 12 months, 24 months, I still wouldn't run a branch as good as they could. And these, these, uh, pay, these professionals are like missionaries. They are dedicated to what they're doing. They're great at what they're doing. The actual lending is done by people of the poor communities. The sons and daughters of low-income people are trained to become center managers. And uh, our customers, we've got 6,000 now in Queens, New York. Uh, well, well, in the New York area in general, but it's on a track to be sustainable, to be profitable. We're not for profit. And it just goes to show you that there's, there's not a single segment that can't be served by a well-designed, well-managed program. We, we're focused now primarily on recent immigrants. We're probably 80% Latino, 10% African American, 10% Asian, and everything else. But we ultimately want to serve everybody below the poverty level, and it's working great. Fabulous. Our guiding philosophy is we look at low-income people as producers, not consumers, who have more capacity than they have resources. And I just want to highlight, and I'd like you to get your questions ready, some of the critical, really game-changing things we've seen. Vidar talked about how he is pairing access to capital with getting people banked with addressing their credit score which is really the entry into the economy today for everyone. David really talked about how do we get the plumbing right? On our board is the former commissioner of the IRS, who's one of the uh, most famous tax lawyers in America, but his father was a plumber. And he always says to us, you've got to get the plumbing right if you're going to get to scale. So David, it's all about what's the platform that we can mainstream savings so it's not just retirement savings, but it's a saving platform forever. Hill Harper told us, how do we change people's view about the power of the marketplace for low-income people? And in fact, the great book, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid, is exactly what he's talking about. One of the only good things that came out of predatory lending is that people saw that low-income people were spending millions of dollars on these services. So if we provided better services, we can help rebuild those economies in the right way. Jose talked about the full range of innovation in products and services and assumptions that can move people into the economic mainstream, but there's not one solution. You have to pair those solutions along a continuum that gets people from financial stability to financial security to actually asset building and wealth creation. And then Emily really spoke to us about the multi-levels from the person to the community to the, to the broader national context and also brought in our need to couple 
short-term savings, which is critical in this economy, with larger long-term goals. So that gives us an incredibly rich framework for us to think about what does economic independence mean today? So I'd like to invite you to ask a question, come right to the mic, and say who you are. And make sure it ends with a question mark. <laughs> Uh, Jim Koppel with Servant Forge Foundation. We're working with tribal communities in the United States and also we work in Africa and several countries there on youth employment. Uh, Peter, I want to ask in terms of uh, what you're doing in your lending here in the United States, uh, what is the interest usually? And the second part of that is what kind of collateral do you uh, it's 15% APR on the declining balance, so that if they borrow $1,000 over the course of a year, they pay $75. The collateral is their promise to pay. They have no collateral. We take no collateral. We don't. We have sort of the a very simple loan agreement that is in a document, and we've uh, only we've only had two cases of fraud where people gave us bad IDs and they came to us with bad intent. But other than that, we've never had anyone intentionally not pay us. No repossession. No repossession, and we, we just wouldn't do that unless there were fraud involved. And that's the case with Grameen all over the world. I might add, the very same model works great with uh, Mayan Indians in Guatemala, with uh, Muslim <coughs> Arabs in Turkey, with Muslims in Bangladesh, with European Hispanics in Costa Rica. Human nature trumps culture everywhere. Thanks so much for all your comments. I'm with Rebuilding Together. My name is Matt DeGaranti, and just listening to all, you may know us as Christmas in April if you're from the DC area historically, but uh, as I think through each of your comments, uh, and what we do is we repair the low-income homes so that people can stay in their homes, our typical homeowners, two people, just over $18,000 in income, and has been in their home 20 years. So think about independence and fixing homes so people can stay in their homes and not spend so much on Medicare, it's huge. But all your comments, sort of to the general thought, think of the economic multiplier. And we talk about it in, you know, it's in classes, but it doesn't seem to be discussed at the low income level. When you lose money, and you start spending it, you lose it exponentially, like you do in that case. And I'm wondering if that's something that might fit or that you thought of as a way of framing for low-income people the critical issues that are at stake in staying independent. Who'd like to tackle that one? I'll, I'll take a stab at it. I think that when we look at the way we talk about uh, financial empowerment, financial literacy with folks in our programs, you're exactly right. And it, it is, it's, there's a snowball effect that's out there that people are basically lining up to be rolled over under, and it, it, it's, it's horrible. It gets worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And, and what frustrated us really was that we saw that there were resources that people could avail themselves of that would, you know, consumer credit counseling, uh, you know, this type of community group doing this type of work. How do we get people together with that? And, and what we really started to realize was people need a way to, to kind of sift their way and steer their way through all the noise, all the activity, all the millions of messages that they were hearing out there. And that's really where we kind of spotlighted on what could we the city do that would help people gain clarity. And we, we started thinking about why not use the city's voice? Think about it, the city's voice tells people all the time the health department say, says, go get your kids uh, immunized, uh, pay attention to nutrition. The police department, the fire department, they say, check your smoke detectors, lock your doors at night. You know, we give out beneficial messages. Why not, not have us say, take care of your money. Avoid getting ripped off. Be smarter about how you invest. I think that it's as much steering people through the resources as it is actually developing the solution that we need. Add uh, one other thing to that. Um, the fact, the fact, we're seeing um, uh, so many people that are, are really, quite honestly, financially insecure for the first time. They, you know, they they were never rich, but they were teetering on the brink, and they were doing okay. They were stable, but a, but a job loss has has pushed them over the edge, and and they are really financially insecure and don't really have 
an understanding of how to navigate, I think to your point, helping them, and we're, we're getting them at that, for lack of a better term, teachable moment. Uh, when they are coming to organizations to seek employment or seek skill building, and that's when I think there's an opportune moment to talk about um, finding, whether you want to call it financial education, we call it financial capability. It's about the decision making that they need to do at a relevant period in their life to make the decisions that, that will help them going forward. So we really try to capture them at that time that may have nothing to do with a financial product or service or savings, but it has everything to do with the job and how they can actually be more financially secure by making the most appropriate decisions now. Thanks very much. I just, Wait. not the nonprofit company, there's a multiplier right there. Right, absolutely. And can I just say, we need to be able to show the return on investment from this work, and that's one of the things we need to work on. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Mary Kay Leonard from the Initiative for a Competitive Inner City, and I have kind of a, a, a comment and then a question, and I'd like to shift the attention to both small businesses, mm -hmm. so, and, and the small businesses that are not in the micro loan category, so we focus in on businesses in the one to five million dollar range in revenue, existing businesses already have a track record of success, of employing people have the opportunity to grow more. And this issue of access to capital, in addition, I would say, to what I would call more business education, not just financial literacy, and access to contracts, to network, to how to get more business, those three accelerants, executive education, capital, and access to networks and contracts, so those are what makes make businesses grow. And we, we run a, a fabulous bunch of small efforts to match uh, some of what inner city businesses in this category with sources of debt and equity. But I'm, I'm always stunned at how little attention, frankly, is on this group that, that we all grow jobs. And so I'm here, I really am wondering whether or not as we think about this agenda, and frankly as we think about some of the innovative programs, particularly we're doing in San Francisco, what kinds of alternative products probably match with the right amount of, you know, whether it's marketing, whether it's HR, whether it's negotiation skills, the, the existing skill sets that we know folks need to grow as they grow their businesses. How, have you seen programs, are you beginning to look at some of those issues? Um, because that's a group that, I won't call it low hanging fruit, but, but they're there and we know they have the opportunity to succeed. Let, let me just comment from San Francisco, I'm sure others will have um, um, more to say as well. But I, I mentioned that we are, are launching a program that's really employer focused. And this is really a first for us. Uh, as, as you may have heard, our, our, all of our other programs were really uh, focused on the individual, the household, uh, the parent, the, the, the youth, and, and now the kindergartner in our kindergarten and college program. But, but the employer really we saw as really a key partner to make, uh, you know, help us get to the individual, but also to make that employer, that business, more successful. One of the, one of the key things that, that was well understood, though not, I think, broadly um, discussed, is that when companies get closer and closer to 100% electronic pay, for example, their costs go down. It's cheaper, it's faster, it's easier, and it's more profitable for the company to not have to write out those paychecks every week, to not have to replace the ones that get lost, not have to distribute them around physically to people. It's a tiny piece of what you're talking about yeah, that makes a business it's successful or not. I mean, these are, these are businesses that often would kind of, we, we, we know that they are 27% less of the national bank now have branches in some of the other certain areas. We know that these are the folks whose credit lines, who they've had a credit line before, have been, have been caught up and not able to be accessed. So I think that's really important and will really matter. Yeah. But I'm just wondering how we, so, how we can build on that. Right. right. Anybody else want to comment on that point? Okay. Um, I actually can talk to you at the, oh, after that's Good. over. Next. Hi there. Um, thank you guys so much for this panel. This has been really eye-opening to me. Um, my name is Gayatri. I'm from Seattle, Washington, and um, I grew up in poverty in California, and today I'm a trustee for the community college in Seattle, and it's been a really interesting experience for me personally to teach my parents about a lot of what you just talked about. And I guess my question is to the programs you have all run, how, what, what it has always seemed to me and felt like is that there's financial education over here and there's real life over here, 
And with the financial insecurity and instability, you really don't have time to stop and learn how to use a checking account because your kids are hungry. So how have your programs, and, and I think you know, in San Francisco, which is not too far from where I grew up, it sounds like a, you're doing a little bit of that, but how do you integrate it into the daily experiences that families are having and not make it something fully separate? We went through a pretty tough learning curve, I'll tell you that. Um, it's not easy, you, you bring up an exactly a valid, very valid point, which is, you know, you can, you can advertise all the financial education classes you want, set up classrooms, have really prepared teachers, and who wants to come down on a weekend and spend 90 minutes learning about how to balance their checkbook and make a budget? Zero. <laughs> so um, we had to get inventive and creative and, and find new ways, because we still knew that we needed to get that, that education out there for people to understand how to handle their, their basic checking account uh, without having overdraft charges, which could put them back into predatory pricing category, right, territory, right? So we actually uh, partnered, we, we did an exciting thing with community groups where we actually did micro loans of our own to community groups that gave them either 100 or $150 and said, if you'll pull 20 people into a room who are really ready to hear this, this information and with the money, buy them some lunch, pay for childcare so they can come and not worry about you know, the fact that, that they, their kids being unattended, whatever the case may be. And now we hold 60 classes a year hosted by these community groups in our community. And the community groups tell us what the audience needs to really be educated about. So I think it's all about forming partnerships. I think many times those partnerships help us realize how to better direct the, the financial ed education because to some degree, Financial education is kind of a just-in-time kind of a thing. I don't really need to know how to, do, how to do a mortgage until it's time for me to do a mortgage, right? I mean, I, I just don't need to know that and carry that around and not use it for five or ten years. So there is this pairing of the things do, and we find our community groups help us. Bill, would you like to comment on that? Yeah. I think that, that uh, Jose, right, I'm all about incentives. And it's just literally what carrots can we find? And it's all about, uh, I get frustrated, you know, when folks come into my foundation and we talk, and they talk about, you know, how come people aren't showing up? We're doing such good work and all this. And it's not about that to me. It's about what incentives are we providing? It's just when I work with schools, for instance, and we, we know the data around parental involvement in, in, in child education, <coughs> educational performance. And then when I'm doing these, when I'm, when I'm doing teacher training and some other things in schools, uh, the, the, the administrators get frustrated and say, you know, the parents just won't show up. I say, well, what mechanisms do you have in place to incentivize them to come? And that's really the question I think we have to ask around all of these issues. How are we incentivizing? I mean, obviously, 100 bucks and child care, et cetera, that's one way. Um, the, the things I like to do is ultimately tie them to a direct, identifiable benefit for the individual somehow. Now, I create, I do all sorts of things. Obviously, um, I'm, I'm on the TV show CSI New York, so one of the things, people like to come to the set and visit the set of CSI New York, right? It's, it, you know, been on the set of a TV show before. So I use that incentive. I use that all the time, you know, uh, because that's, that's a big carrot for some people. If you don't watch my show, you probably don't care. <laughs> um, but some people do. Um, so, so the, all of these types of incentives, they could be real money incentives, they could be experiential incentives. There are so many different types of incentives we can provide individuals for participation and things that we know that they should, we believe they should already want to participate in, but they don't know that yet. So we can't assume that. Let's provide them the incentives. I see a whole new TV show on doctors giving financial lessons. <laughs> I like that a lot. Point out one thing: We're doing a lot of research right now into uh, financial literacy and the like. And initially, financial literacy was how do you make everybody an MBA, which is not in the slightest reality. <laughs> but if you, we're learning now that it's at times. So if you use the automatic choices that I mentioned for things like retirement savings and other savings and things like that, so people are in and they've actually had a good choice that has been got, they've been guided to to start with. And then as they get experience with that, as they start to see, oh, here's my interest coming in here. Uh, I've got a certain amount of money here. What should I do with that? It's at that point that 
they will guide themselves much more. And this is not the matter of just the traditional come on in and sit down and do your 90 minutes. It's a matter of now I've got something, what am I going to do with it? So I'm going to ask our last two questioners to ask their questions in a row, and then we, everybody can just answer. Thank you for all of your comments. My name is Jackie Mitchell Edwards. I'm with the Fossil Del Norte Group, uh, which is West Texas and Southern New Mexico, and Juarez, Mexico. Uh, and it's a follow-up on Gayatri's question, really. Uh, in trying to achieve economic independence, I'm pleased to see that we've got the private sector, government, and not-for-profit slash NGO sector. I'd like for you all to share with me some of your ideas and experiences of building these public-private partnerships that break down the barriers between our separate silos because we can do really well in each of our silos, but unless we are making partnerships across silos, it's hard to see how we can combat these problems. So if you could share with us some of your experiences in building those kind of public-private partnerships. Great question. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Maurice Matthews. I am um, an Opportunity uh, Scholar uh, here with Opportunity Nation. And I'm representing DC Social Innovation Project which is a uh, project that some friends of mine, we founded this year to fund young social entrepreneurs in the DC areas who have new and innovative ideas to attack social ills in the community. Um, my, my question surrounds though, um, how do we, uh, or what, are your, what are some of your ideas on quelling this thing that, that we consider um, generational poverty, of which um, I am a product of, and so this idea, you know, we have thinking about the older our parents at XYZ who never had bank accounts, um, who have been victims of predatory lending, et cetera, but they're stuck in a certain mindset where they're not thinking about financial literacy. That It's sort of a, a systematic change needs to um, so, sort of be shifted in their mind. So how do you attack that when they just don't know or they may be stuck in their old ways of doing things? How do you change that to help them get out of the sort of the situations that they're in, uh, the financial situations that they're in? So how do we change heads, and how do we create new partnerships? Do we want to just go down the line so everybody can have a final word? Vidar, you want to start? Well, the partnerships that work best for us are with partners that provide essential services that we absolutely need, like Experian for the credit reporting, Citibank, and Capital One, and now we're starting to look for healthcare partners um, to provide access to healthcare. So I think as long as there's a fundamental mutual need partner works and where there isn't that fundamental need it works less well. On changing heads, uh, my mother for instance grew up during the depression and she has, uh, the concept of the stock is something that just sends her into shivers uh, <laughs> 80 years later. And it, it's going to be more a matter of reaching to the younger the, the fact is, younger people communicate differently. I, I have an older daughter who's 25, and she she now tells me that, Dad, when you email me, you're, you're so old-fashioned, etc. But there are ways, a, a friend of mine in the UK is working on a new type of social outreach that actually uses technology on one hand and uh, a, a different viewpoint. And I think that's going to be more of what it is. My mother is set in her ways. My father and I tried to shift her for years and it never worked. So it's now a matter where my daughter understands and joined her 401k and started her savings account. She actually started savings when she was five. So go to the next level. You know, uh, this is gonna sound very theoretical but I want you guys to just, just wrap your head around it just for a little bit, uh, because I think this is ultimately where the conversation has to go when we talk about money and wealth, and that is simply that we have gotten to a place where we overvalue money. We overvalue money to such a degree that we justify uh, negative and deceptive behavior as being okay. 
we've gotten to a place where money uh, was invented to uh, replace the barter system. You know, so you didn't have to carry around seven potatoes to exchange for a chicken. And so therefore, it was something that was benign. It was just a replacement. Now we've gotten to a place where we attach so much value to this, to this paper that we have gotten to a place where if you are smart enough to trick somebody out of theirs, then that's okay because it's so valuable. And we are living in a world where the mindset of most private corporations is what's the most I can charge and provide the least for. And because we, as individuals, overvalue money, we allow that and these types of activities to continue. And until we decide that those types of activities are, are, are not acceptable, until we actually reassess the actual value of money and, and stop teaching people that money is a result, but rather it's a tool, then we will continue to see uh, and justify behavior that is basically big time, Ponzi, three card Monty, money grabs. And with technology and the ability to move money so quickly right now, we are seeing more and more sophisticated models of money grabbing and it's going to continue unless we decide to stop it. You're so true. And yeah. All, all the more reason we need more and more education. Uh, but I want to switch back to what, how we pulled our together, our public, private, community, three-way, four-way different partnership, for example, in our Bank on San Francisco program. I think what we need to do is we need to understand that we need all the different pieces of our community to make programs like this oftentimes successful. We wanted to get people away from predatory check cashers. We wanted them to become customers of private, for-profit financial institutions in the age of Occupy. That sounds like a, a bad thing. But in a way, we knew that it was going to be better for these folks who would then not be getting, continue to be getting ripped off. So we were OK with telling the, you know, the for-profits, it's OK. You can do your for-profit thing. Let's just do it in a way that allows you to be fair and even-handed and appropriate about it with, uh, with low-cost folks. And let's get the community groups engaged. And what is it that they're looking for? They're looking for ways to make their members more successful. So we wanted to find a way that we could engage with them and the, the, the micro-loans and, and the classes in there. And then the government, what are we really seeking for? We're, we're looking for our whole city to do better. If our individual households are more successful and stronger financially, our whole local economy grows. People who aren't getting ripped off have more money to keep at home and invest back in their homes, into their businesses, or to pay for their kids' education. So that is a, a, you know, a multi-way win that we need to put together, and that's what I think any of us go forward. Um, we've, we've said it a couple times, I think, today um, around the, the the term return on investment. Um, and I think it, it actually goes across both of the questions. Um, when we're looking at, at the public-private partnerships, and we, we've struggled, I mean, there's challenges around that definitely, particularly as we've looked at a national level. You know, we're always looking for that turnkey relationship, another national nonprofit or another, you know, national company that we can just turn the key and suddenly it's dispersed all across the country and helping everyone. The reality is that doesn't happen. Um, you've got to really go community by community or um, location by location. But critically important in that, and I think that's probably what you've been in San Francisco a lot, is you, you, there's got to be a central partner who's kind of owning, for lack of a better term, the process and the pieces of it. To, the main role being understanding the ROI for all the partners to engage. Um, and particularly when you're talking about business, particularly when you're talking about banks, it's it's not a philanthropic effort. I mean, they care about their communities, but it's not a philanthropic effort. So, so particularly in the nonprofit world, spending some time really looking at the ROI for your partners um, and being able to present that and quantify that is critically important. I mean, we did that with employers when we were trying to engage them around older worker issues. We're doing that in the financial services industry to really, as you have done, um, but. But being a voice for that ROI of all the partners to engage. And quite frankly, to the other question, there's got to be an ROI for an individual as well. 
And we've seen that a lot, particularly with the older generation, as they've lost jobs and need to re-career, get into something they never planned on getting into. There's got to be a return on their investment of time and energy and, and finances. Um, and, and that's a very intrinsic um, thing. It, it's, it's not the same from person to person. So part of identifying that ROI is really to tap into what's most important to them. We've seen great success in getting older adults to change their, their savings behavior because it's important to their grandkids. It, they're saving for their grandkids, not for themselves. It's not about themselves. It's the fact that they can put some away for college for their grandkids. So part of, of changing that behavior is really tapping into what's important to that individual. So I'll leave you with three lines before I thank our extraordinary panel. One thing we discovered is parents and grandparents will do for their children what they will not do for themselves. We discovered in our first demonstration with match savings that the lowest income people save the highest percentage of their budget. It was stunning, we never expected it. And it was again the price of hope and hope for their children. Number two, it's making the business case. And how do we make that business case in a way that meets all the needs of the partners but also makes it sustainable, which is a whole nother level. And the last piece, which has been inherent in everything, is how do we align the incentives? I talked about policy before and how it's so easy to put policy for middle and upper class people, but how do we think about aligning those incentives? Not just the public policy incentives, but the private incentives and the nonprofit incentives that make these things work. And with that, I want to thank what is an absolutely extraordinary panel and wish we had two more hours. Thank you.